I feel like we're home right here. You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. Good Monday, Cougar Nation. That's the good Monday. It's a great Monday after BYU's streak-busting, headline-making milestone win at Wisconsin. Welcome back inside the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. 48 hours ago at Camp Randall Stadium in Madison, BYU handed the Badgers their first non-conference home loss in more than 15 years. And today, we're breaking it down and taking your questions for defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki and offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes. Coach Tuiaki, my guest in the first 30 minutes with Coach Grimes joining me for the back half hour. Great to have you with us today live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, ESPN 960, and BYU Football Facebook Live. If you're not with us live, you can also get us uh, this weekly broadcast on demand via podcast, online, multiple apps, and the BYU Football Facebook page. We also invite you to join our conversation on Twitter with questions for the coaches using hashtag CCBYU or via comments on the BYU Football Facebook Live page. First up today, it's a defensive coordinator and defensive line coach, Elisa Tuiaki. And Coach E, congratulations on a great win on the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, huge, I think, for the for the players, for the coaches, but also just, you know, we landed and got back and saw all those people there at the airport welcome. I think it was a huge win for, for Cougar Nation. So did, did you really expect excited. a crowd? No, I, I expect some people, but it was, I mean, well, about a thousand people there. I mean, it was really cool, you know, and they, they lined up a cougar walk and the team went through as they were walking to their cars. It was really cool. So you, you've been around the coaching game a long time and as a player too, and you've had big wins in the past, but uh, for the moment, that one had to be right up there with among the most special games you've been a part of. Yeah, that was that was sweet, man. It was a great venue, a really, really good team, but the boys played inspired and and uh, I mean, it was just a, such a big win for the program. And what a difference a week makes, right? You know, last week we're here kind of talking about a, dis a disappointment at home against Cal and, and how you guys were going to bounce back and, and what a bounce back. In, in a way, this is something I even asked the players after the game Saturday, did, did what happened against Cal kind of sow the seeds for what you guys did in uh, in Madison. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know, but but uh, I know that they came out ready to play, you know, and and uh, you always you always ask that question if we were 2 and 0, would we have gone in with the same fire, with the same determination and um, you know, losing a Cal at home that close, I think was an eye opener for everybody and and uh, just you know, everybody knew that they had to work even harder to uh, to reach their goals, and and uh, and that was that was huge. Kalani spoke before the game about uh, a real confidence that is that his guys had that they were going to actually uh, win that game, and it wasn't just a, a rah rah thing. Let's go! It was it was like no, we we we're we're going in with the right attitude, and it's and it's going to work for us today. Yeah, no, definitely. That I think I think that was huge, and we look back to when we played them last year. Um, I think that, that we had a lack of confidence. There's a lack of confidence on both sides of the ball. And, and uh, I mean, their quarterback went 18 for 19, I think it was. And our, we, weren't, we weren't playing confidently. And, uh, you know, this, this year was different. I mean, the kids went in believing that they could win. Um, we knew that, that uh, not too many people gave us a, cho a shot. But we felt like uh, if we could play sound and both sides of the ball as well as special teams was clicking, I think that we, we definitely had a shot to win. In last year's game could, against them, could you tell kind of early that the vibe wasn't right? And in this year's game, could you tell pretty early on this was going to be a fist fight and we're in it? Yeah, yeah, you, you could tell. You know, it's uh, um, you know some of the woes that we were having as a team back then kind of start to show. And uh, you know, I'm talking about last year. Yeah. And then uh, you know, it's just it's just hard to believe when when you're not clicking in, in all phases and you feel like you might be going out there and and. Uh, you know whether you play well or not isn't going to make a difference to towards you winning and you know right now there's a big belief on both sides of the ball with special teams and and uh you know we feel like we can go out there and, and compete with anybody so many things to get to uh on the game at madison 
But turnover margin is a pretty good place to start. There was only one giveaway on the day, and it was Wisconsin's giveaway and your takeaway, and that one turnover turned into a touchdown, which at the end of the day ends up to be a pretty big play. So Zane Anderson making that pick, setting you up, and then the offense pu- uh, punching it in was maybe the difference maker. Yeah, I mean, we look at one, one takeaway the whole game, and it was I think it was the difference maker, and it was, uh, it was huge for us. We had we had some opportunities that uh, we felt like we could have took advantage of, and, and we didn't, but that one we did. And, uh, I mean, it was huge for us to be able to do that, and as well as the offense capitalizing off it. I think that was, that was huge for the team. And uh, you're three games in, and in the two wins, no giveaways for the offense. So you've not given the ball away in either of the two wins yet. And again, that's a pretty good way to start if you want to win a football game. Yeah, I, th- I think that's key, man. That's uh, you know they talk about that being the the second most important stat in winning a football game is your is your your turnover margin. Um, you know, obviously the score being the first stat, but I mean it's huge when the offense take care of the ball and moving it and and successful. Um, and we can we can get some takeaways, then you know, we're, we're in a pretty good spot. So if anybody were to tick off uh, a list of, of the most physical, dominant, trench-based type football teams, Wisconsin's going to be up there every time someone's talk, t- someone talks about those kinds of teams. So with that being said, one of those games where you kind of want to have all hands on deck and make sure your biggest and toughest guys are in there, and, and yet you played a game without Butch Pau, your starting middle linebacker. Uh, you lost a playmaker in Diane Gomoloku. And for a time, you even lost Sione, who had a wonderful game and had a career high in tackles. He did come back in, I think, after he got dinged, right? But he did lose him for a time. Mm -hmm. So those are, you know, three big-time playmakers. One you don't have, one you lose, you know, relatively halfway through, and one, you know, gets dinged for a time. Wow. I mean, I talk about the depth required to win that kind of game when you weren't necessarily at full speed. Yeah, you know, I think uh, when you're talking about all hands on deck, it's, it's the next guy up being ready to to fulfill the role and uh and uh you know carry the flag and push it forward and you know those guys whose numbers were called um did a phenomenal job coming in and and uh I mean, there's no doubt in this long season that we're going to need all of those guys you know especially getting butch back healthy and and uh dying back healthy um we're gonna need all those guys to to continue to push and and uh you know win all these games in the future um, but uh, I mean, I commend those those guys that came in and took their spots and and rose to the occasion and showed up when they were when they were needed. And uh, you had I think one sack through two games. You had two sacks in this game. Sione got one, and everyone says, "Well, Taki Taki's going to get his." How happy are you for a guy like Zach Dodd to be the guy that got the other? <laughs> he, uh, if we had to go back on the field, he wouldn't have been able to go. He was he's so tired just from celebrating, and we were all pumped up for him. And so, you know, the routine normally after you get off the field is. Uh, we come immediately to the bench so we can talk about adjustments and things that we need and reminders and all that. Um, the whole D-line came back to the bench, and I look around. I was like, where's Zach? And he's running up and down the sideline just yelling and screaming. And I'm yelling down there. He couldn't hear me, but I'm just like, hey, get over here. Act like you've been there before. And Corbin goes, coach, he hasn't been there before. I was like, all right, we'll just let him celebrate for a little bit. We just stood there and just watched him celebrating for a little bit. And then finally when he came in, huffing and puffing after celebrating, we just, you know, congratulated him. And, I, I you know, in the moment, you don't think about how big of a thing that is for a guy like that, a freshman coming in and um, and uh, being able to do something like that in a big-time game. But, uh, you know, he was, he was almost – I mean, he was so close to hanging up, hanging up the pads with his back surgery and all that stuff. But he fought back, and and you know, I'm so proud to see see a kid like that come back and and have a little success. Well, you know, those uh, those Daw boys, uh, something special about him. Parker was a heck of a player for yeah. BYU too, and and now yeah. Zach's following in the footsteps. Yeah, Zach, Zach is tough as nails. I mean, I love what he's done, and and respect him as a, as a kid and a person. And he's gonna have a bright future just because of that. All right, heading into our first break on the Coordinator's Corner. When we come back, more from defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki, including your questions from social media. Use the hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. Back with more right after this from Studio 3 in the BYU Broadcasting Building. Stay with us. Call it a path. Or a way through. It can be arrow straight or have twists and turns. It's life's financial journey, and Mountain America Credit Union is here to guide you every step of the way. With timely advice and affordable products, this is your journey. Let's begin together. We're Mountain America, guiding you forward. This September, see the good in the world with exciting shows on BYU TV. 
Get ready to laugh because Studio C is on every Monday at 7 Mountain with all your favorite characters and hilarious antics. Come along with Todd Hansen as he discovers all new stories on all new episodes of The Story Trek, Tuesdays at 8 Mountain. It's a new season of Relative Race with more puzzles, relatives, and surprises along the way. Sundays at 7 Mountain. There's something for everyone here on BYU TV. A foundling hospital. A vow of friendship. A ruthless matron. self-willed girl with plans of her own. Don't miss the next episode of Heady Feather, Sunday at 6 Mountain on BYU TV. I got no chill. The BYU TV Sports Post Game. BYU versus McNeese State. Saturday after the game. Blue runs deep on BYU TV. Don't miss the BYU Pacific Women's Volleyball Game. Thursday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV. Your home for Cougar Sports. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads. JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman, BYU now. Two and one after a weekend win at Wisconsin. And with the win, the Cougars re-enter the AP Top 25 poll for the first time since 2015. Wisconsin is out of the top 10 after 26 straight weeks in the top 10. It was also the Badgers' first loss after a 20-game regular season win streak and that 41-game non-conference home win streak dated back to 2003. Visiting now with defense coordinator Elisha Tuiaki, and that's a whole lot of stuff tied up in one win. Big win. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't know all the stuff. <laughs> You're not supposed Obviously. to. Yeah. Uh, you faced a Jonathan Taylor, uh, who is currently second in FBS rushing in yards per game at 170-plus, but he came in averaging 200 per and he, was, uh, he, he got his 117 yards, but big plays were limited. And on the flip side, BYU's guy, Squally, ended up with one more rushing yard than <laughs> JT23. Not too bad. Uh, we, were, we, we went into the, into the locker room after and, you know, got the stat sheet. And, and uh, man, I, I, was so, I was so happy. He's just so proud that, um, you know, the boys played hard. But also, our, our guy outrushed their guy by a yard. But, I mean, if you look at his yards per carry, our guy killed their guy in yards per carry. And, I mean, he's a good player, right? And, and they, we know that they're a, they're a really good program. But uh, we're just so proud of the way that the boys played and to be able to, to do that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the offense is just as proud to have a guy that, that uh, rushed more than their, you know, Heisman hopeful. It's not going to happen often in a game that he gets outrushed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh that was, uh, that was cool to see. You mentioned in the last segment how Alex Hornibrook, their quarterback, went 19 for 20 last year. And this year was a, was a much more average game for him, didn't have the same kind of stats. Was there a difference in how you played him or played against him just uh, from an overarching standpoint of how you performed against their guy at quarterback? You know, I think the the biggest difference was um, last year we you know we made them earn everything in the run, but we didn't stop the run. Um, you know, this year we made them earn everything in the run. Um, you know, they, they still, I, I think that they still ran for a lot of yards, but they went away from, from what they normally do, you know, and staying in the big personnels and pushing people around and kind of, um, you know, out physicaling everybody. Um, you know, there's at one point we, we, you know, talking on the headset, we're like, they, they don't think they can run on us. Hmm. They've gone away from their big packages or staying in smaller packages and trying to hit us on the perimeter. And, and, uh, I think that was probably the biggest difference because, um, you know, when you're able to run the ball and, and uh, throw in play action pass and do all that stuff, I think it just opens everything up. And our, our corners were, were, were giving some things up early in the game last year, and we weren't playing as confident. But this year, you know, um, Chris Wilcox played just lights out defense. I mean, he was so physical in the run, but played sticky in, the, in, in, in pass coverage. And, you know, we challenged those guys to play with confidence and play with good technique, and they did. I mean, the, the corners, the, all the freshman corner that played, I mean, mm -hmm. we were so excited about how they played, and the, and the secondary played really well when it came to just coverage. I want to bring up a moment uh, that just you kind of triggered in my mind. It was 7-7, so we're early in the game. It's first quarter still. Wisconsin's driving under four minutes to play in the opening quarter. They've, they get a third and four. 
at their own 42. They complete a pass for three yards. Sets up a fourth and one at their own 45-yard line. So close enough to midfield where it's going to be a question. You're Wisconsin. You've got that legendary O-line. You've got Jonathan Taylor. You've got a yard near midfield. What a sign of respect they punted on that play. They did, and that's, uh, you know, I I think – I don't know. I don't know if they if it was against other people, if they would still would have done it. I mean, do you remember that moment though? Was saying, "Hey, we got like this, yeah, this we be a did. fight." We, you know, it, we, we 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 said we need to leave the defense on the field. I think we're think, think, I think they're going to go for it, and they sent the punt field punt team out there. Then I think we ended up staying in safe defense just because we were just like, okay, we just got to make sure that we get the ball back. But uh, it was. I mean. We were confident the whole time that our D line was going to put up a good fight. We we're going to make them earn everything, and and uh, I mean they rose to the occasion and, and played hard. After the game, uh, Kalani talked about having fun, and that's maybe kind of a cliche in football. It's a game after all, but he said, "I don't mean lo- lo- loss of focus. It's quite fun." And and it seemed like start to finish, the team and you're playing well, of course, which helps. You had fun between third and fourth quarter. You're jumping around with the with the fans, you know. And 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 he said that's that's an important part of our formula is having fun playing this game we love and not being so wound up. You know what he's you know where he's going with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just uh, I think we you know there's there's so much pressure on these kids and there's so much going on that. Um, a lot of times you do forget to have fun. You, you forget, you know, you're so wound up in your assignment, alignment, technique, and 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 all the little things. And there's so many so many intricate parts of football that you require of these kids that they forget to have fun. I mean, I mean now um, to be able to look back and say you played in a, in a really cool venue against a, a really good team, and you had fun doing it, and we won. I mean, that's um, I, th- I think it's a good reminder, and it's, and it's great coming from a head coach because a lot of times the head coach is kind of like, we're having too much fun, we're too loose, we mm. need to tighten down a little bit. And for Kalani to do that and feel confident in, in knowing that that's the message that the kids needed in order to win was, was huge. Let's go to social media now, at Stevie PF 22 on Twitter with the hashtag CCBYU. Uh, the question is, I'm curious if there are any splits in responsibility for passing and running game plans on defense like there are for the offense. And are you aware of any programs that do do that? Yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot of different programs that do it differently. There's a guy that's a little bit more in charge of the pass and, um, you know, one that's in charge of the runner. And we're, and we're we don't, we don't uh, separate it like that per se, but the secondary guys are a little bit more tuned in and keyed into what, what the pass game looks like. And, um, you know, when we're in the middle of the game, um, you know, we're talking about it all the time. Okay, you know, we're coming up on a third down, and this team huddles, and I'm saying, okay, what do you guys like? I don't think that they're beating man yet. You know, we can do this, we can do this, and what do you guys want? You know, I'm always leaning on them to make sure that that we're doing what they think is uh, we're playing confidently, as well as uh, what what they think. You know, that we're going to get as far as route combinations and the best way to play it. And we're talking about it all the time when it comes to game plan. We do it the same way. We'll we'll uh, we'll watch watch everything together, and we'll talk, and we'll. Um, you know, make suggestions, put the game plan together, and then when it comes into it, I'll lean heavily on those guys. And um, you know, Coach Lamb's kind of in both worlds, just because of what he's, his background and and uh, being able to you know be keyed into the run, to, into the box as well as secondary. And he's great that way. You know, I rely a lot on on Preston as well as uh, Gennaro to to uh, be keyed into the secondary, and Ed Lamb's kind of you know, one foot on both sides in the run game as well as the pass game. What are you hearing in the headset on game days? What's your headset uh, alignment? What do you want to hear? What do you like to hear? And and uh, what are you switching on and off kind of thing? Yeah, you know, from from the box uh, during the during the the uh, the series, it's it's uh, you know hash. You know, left, left, middle, middle of the field, right, middle, right, hash, the hash down in distance and personnel, the most important things that come from the box. And then as uh, the, the offense breaks the huddle and gets lined up, you know, Preston as well as our, our graduate assistants are in the box and they're saying, OK, you're getting this formation. Uh, we're looking at this play in this down in distance. You might get this. Watch for this coming over here. You know, and if I'm you know want something specific in the front, then I'll I'll talk to Coach Feula who's up there and say, hey, watch this guy. I want to make sure this is being done. Hey, we're looking for you know this play might be coming. I want to make sure that we pop this block or my hands go the right way. And just a lot of technical stuff that's going on. And then as we get into you know down distances, second downs and third downs. Third downs a big one, obviously, where we talk about. But um, trying to trying to keep the chatter to a minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you give up a play on first down, and then all of a sudden it's second and one. There's a lot of yelling going. On. Well, this guy did this, and he needs to do this, and it's just like, okay, give me, give me the hash down and distance personnel. Let's get to the next one. We'll try to fix this, and you know, what, when we get off the field, um, I think that's that's a, the hardest challenge because you're always wanting to fix it and talk about it right there. 
Um, but uh, it's it, it's been good. You know, Preston's got great eyes on the box, and we have a lot of experience with our with our our guys that are in the box right now, with our graduate assistants as well as um, Randy Coy, who's who was with us at Utah for a long time. When uh, when BYU's offense is on the field, what's happening in here with your headset? Anything? Uh, when the offense is on the field, when your offense is on it's, the field, it's it's quick adjustments. Okay, what uh, what where were the problems? And what we need to fix, and is there something we need to talk to the boys about? And and it's really okay. The problems were really just missed tackles. Talk to them about being, making tackles, being confident, or the problem was this formation. Make sure that we got eyes in the right spot, and so we'll come together and talk to them about specifics. And you know, um, we've got we've got uh, a guy that's helping out with the secondary. Coach Guilford's there. Coach Lamb will take care of the backers, and I'll take care of uh, the D line, and then. After after we're done talking to our players, and we come back together, and it's kind of like, okay, anything else? You guys see anything else? You feel anything else? Are we good? Do we need to make any adjustments? And once we're done, we kind of click off, and uh, like it quiet. But sometimes you'd be like, why are they doing that? Or you know, <laughs> you, you turn into a fan on the on the, when the offense is on there, talking a little bit, you know, talking crap about their defense, what they're doing wrong, or whatever, what you would do, and. You know, that's that's all it's fun to do. But <laughs> There's a lot going on. Coming up next, more of your questions from social media for Coach Elisa Tuiaki. Use hashtag CCBYU on Twitter or comments on BYU Football Facebook Live. This is the Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Back with more right after this. When my grandfather started this company in 1947, he couldn't have envisioned what we would ultimately become. We realize that our value to our customers is that we will be there day after day, year after year, doing whatever we need to to find solutions to the challenges that they face. We are committed to be honestly better in all that we do, in every opportunity that we have to serve our customers. Get ready for sports action here on BYU TV. Tonight at 5.30 Mountain, kick off the night with an exciting women's soccer game between BYU and Long Beach State. It's sure to have you on your feet. Live Thursday at 7 Mountain, BYU and Pacific go at it in a high-stakes women's volleyball matchup. Shout ace for the Cougars as they battle it out with the Tigers. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. Yo, man, I'm about to get Kurt Cramer here. I thought you said it was like a masterpiece. The scorpion stung me. It's like a masterpiece in the sense that it's not what. The poison. You're already dying. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Two for one sound bar, baby. Woo! <laughs> Sir, I don't think this is going to work. Writers have to have a thick skin. Yes, I see you wrote that on page 20. Maybe try less bad cop, more good cop. Don't miss Studio C tonight at 7 Mountain on BYU TV. Hi there, how are you? My name's Todd. Can we put you on our TV show for a second? If any lesson can be learned from the story track. I felt misunderstood. I felt like there was no one in the world who was going through that thing. I hope people will understand that they're special. I'm a believer. They're important. I'm a believer. I got right there saved my life. They have a compelling story. They are worth getting to know. Watch the story track tomorrow at 8 Mountain on BYU TV. BYUCougars.com You are in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys, 25th ranked BYU. By the way, it feels good to say, 25th ranked BYU hosting FCS foe McNeese State this Saturday. BYU back in the top 25 after the weekend win at Wisconsin 24-21. More social media questions. Let's go to uh, at Dan Haslam. Good buddy, Dan. Uh, How do you stay ready for McNeese State this weekend with a uh, top 10 matchup with Washington looming? Now BYU's ranked, Washington ranked. And by the way, for folks that haven't heard, the game time has been set in Seattle. It'll be a 5.30 Seattle time kick on the 29th. How do you feel about the kick time, by the way? I, I'm, I mean, those games are so much better for us. I, You know, the late games are always difficult, especially when you're away because you finish and, and the travel, and by the time you get back, it just throws off your clock. And, 
um, you know, it, you know, we, we can deal with it as coaches, but it just it always bothers me that the, the kids' clocks are thrown off. You know, and you're trying to kind of get back in and and get back into things and making sure that they're they're uh, able to go to school and concentrate as well as kind of concentrate in in, the, in practices and all that. And so those are always tough. And so moving it up is is really good. I'm excited for that. So Dan's question about staying ready. Uh, again, you've got that Washington game on the other side of it. A couple of ranked teams in a couple of weeks, but McNeese State comes in as an FCS. Uh, uh, how do you stay ready and get ready for this? kind of game you know um that we just don't look past to the next week i mean this uh <clears throat> so many teams lose to fcs teams you know um this year nichols beat nichols beat kansas yeah right and they just beat nichols last week i mean you kind of look at things like that but um this week and this team i mean we're, we're ripe for the picketing according to you know according to just basically they they would look at it and say these guys are looking past us and getting ready for u-dub and and uh, you know we're really we're plenty confident we're going to go in there and take it away. And so we just got to get keep our kids kids ready and keep them focused and make sure that we're still demanding a lot from them and practicing the right way and doing everything the right way on and off the field. Um, you know, it's just I think it's just constant reminders to make sure that they understand these guys are coming in to, to, to take it take it away from you and you got to be ready. Um, we've got to come in prepared just like we do every week. What's an early first glance at McNeese? What kind of talent do they draw from? Where they're based and uh, what kind of team do they have at three and zero right now? You know, I, I've, I've got a little experience um, just playing against them. You know, I played at Southern Utah, and we'd play some of the teams from the Southland Conference. And, and uh, McNeese, as I remember it as a player, always had um, guys that were on NFL on NFL pro- prospective lists. Um, you know, they've always got bounce backs come back from LSU and just some of those other teams um, out there in that area. And I expect to have for them to have a lot of really good players, some talented players, good skill kids, um, and they're going to come out. They're going to play. They're going to play hard. And so, um, you know, just looking at them early this year, you know, obviously they're three and zero. They've got uh, they they do have some good players. You know, we looked at their their roster, looked at their lineup, their depth chart, and they've got some big boys up front. They've got some good skill kids and a really good job with their schemes. And so we've just got to make sure that we game plan it the right way and and get the kids ready and keep them humble and and not looking past to the next one. Okay. Uh, you've got three sacks, defensive sacks in three games. Uh, how do you like that number? And at Bro Chacho, at BYU Bro Chacho asks, uh, what could be done to get more pressure on QBs in the future if you're not where you're at, uh, what, where you want to be right now in terms of pressures? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. I think that we just got to keep plugging away. You know, I don't. Uh, the, the last thing that that uh, we want to do is start, um, you know, reaching reaching a little bit too far. Try to try to get that stat up. Chasing numbers. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think the stat will come as we continue to focus on what we need to do. Um, you know, as I've seen it in the past, sacks really. Um, more more of a technical thing than it is anything else. And when you want to pressure the quarterback with four, um, you've got to be really good technicians. And we're you know we're we're getting there. We're not there yet. And there's been a lot that's been asked of the D linemen. There's been some, been some things that we've changed in the off season. And and uh, you know I don't want to abandon it yet. I want to continue to stick with it and just be patient. Just keep plugging away with it. But I think that we're close um, to getting where we need to be. And and uh, you know the, the type of teams and the teams that we played. I mean it's. You know, didn't expect to get any against Arizona. Thought we were going to get more against uh, um, you know, Cal, Cal and yeah. and this week against Wisconsin. Didn't think that we were going to have an opportunity. Just you know, just as far as just the way that they play their offense and and uh, more Max Pro and running the ball, run the ball type stuff. And so, well, uh, you know, <clears throat> the key is just stay patient. And just just keep plugging away at what we're doing. Have you broken down your five defensive PIs and do you see common threads there? And these are things you're okay with? Yeah, yeah. You know, you're going to give up PIs. The the one that we gave up on the third down, I thought was a bad call, and uh, you know as soon as our I, Isaiah Heron, it was on him as soon as he, you know the play was done, uh, we were talking about on this on the headset, say talk to him and tell him no problem at all, keep it up, keep playing aggressive, don't back off at all, and um, you know we talk to our team about it all the time. But when you're playing as much man as we do, you're going to give some up, but just keep playing confidently, keep playing with technique, and and uh, we'll we'll work past all those. Okay, Saturday is the first day of fall. So it's truly football weather. It's a four o'clock kick. It's at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. You're ranked in the top 25, and hopefully a chance to go to three and one. Hope it's a great week of work, and uh, hope it's a great Saturday for you guys. Yeah, no, I'm, I know. I'm sure it will be. All right, Coach Tuiaki, thanks for your time. Thank you. All right, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you in a, a couple weeks. Couple I think you're weeks. off. You're off yep. next week. We'll see you in a couple weeks. All right, that's Coach Elisa Tuiaki. Coming up after the break, I'll be joined by BYU offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes as the coordinator's corner continues. Brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. Back after this. 
AAA agents like Leticia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance, like when it comes time to buy a car. So how can I help you today? What if I decide to become a rideshare driver? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. In the timeline of life, you make choices every day. Like buying your first car, what a beaut. Or serving your mission, you come home and hop right into college. And then that magic day comes, marriage. Getting married is incredible and pricey. But you know what? Children are even pricier. Your family grows and you need that first home. No matter where you are in the timeline of life, Deseret First Credit Union is right there with you. DFCU, your values, your timeline, your financial future. AAA agents like Rich are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance, like at an open house. So what questions do you have for me? Do we have to have insurance before we even buy the house? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. I'm Dave McCann. Tomorrow on After Further Review, we review Wisconsin and preview McNeese State. Blaine Fallon, David Nixon, Brian Logan explain the game. It's the best hour of BYU football on TV tomorrow night here on BYU TV. Some say if you're looking for the soul of America, you'll find it right here in Memphis, Tennessee. But if Memphis is the soul of America, then what's the soul of Memphis? From the banks of the Mississippi to the neon lights of Beale Street, that soul's hiding somewhere, and I've got to put it all in one painting. Join me as we paint the town of Memphis, Tennessee. Don't miss Painting the Town tomorrow at 830 Mountain on BYU TV. Tomorrow on BYU Football with Kalani Sitake, the coach recaps the Wisconsin game, previews the matchup with McNeese State, and answers your questions using the hashtag Sitake Show. Watch BYU Football with Kalani Sitake tomorrow at 8 Eastern on BYU TV. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads. JCW's quality and a lot of it. In Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. The second half hour of the coordinator's corner begins now. And scheduled to join us is offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes, who hasn't quite made his way into Studio 3 yet, but I think maybe walking in as we speak. He's going to walk in right either behind me or in front of me. And there he is. Coach Jeff Grimes is in the building. This is live radio and TV, folks, and it's a beautiful thing. But all kinds of leeway granted to anybody who wants it after the Wisconsin win on the weekend. Jeff, good to see you. Hey, good to be here. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> not, not a problem at all. Uh, it, it's a, it, every day's a busy day, but Mondays are busy days. Uh, they are. You know, you got to wrap up the previous game, then you're on to the next one already. And, uh, and we are on. And, and Coach Grimes, last time he was on, said, Greg, you get some, you get some slack. We can talk about the last game a little bit because it's kind of your job. But from a mentality standpoint, there really is truly a rearview mirror Madison thing, and you're on to next Saturday, right? Absolutely. So... Um, after every game, win or lose, you get 48 hours to kind of digest it, and then and then you move on. And if you don't do that, um, then you end up falling into trouble. And and I think that might have been a little bit of our problem from week one to week two. And as much as you try to get the message across, sometimes uh, some of these lessons are better learned by living through it firsthand. Which brings us to the question that got asked uh, a couple of times uh, by me to players on Saturday, and Kalani sort of addressed it, and you're hinting at it right now. You'd love to be 3-0, and and you're three points away, you could say, from being 3-0. That's one way to look at it. And then the other side is, okay, if you came into Madison 2-0, and would you have had the same edge? Would you have played the same way? Would you have gotten the same result that you did had everything gone smoothly to that point? I guess the short question would be, did what happened against Cal help create what transpired in Madison? How do you view it? I think there's no question it did for us on offense. And the defense played a good game against Cal, so I can't speak to them or the special teams. But in terms of us on offense, I told the offensive team after the Cal game that we didn't earn the right to go out and play well and that the practice and preparation that week wasn't the same that it was against Arizona. It wasn't as sharp. Um, and I don't think we were quite as hungry for a win as we were week one. And um, had we somehow snuck out a win against Cal, I think it would have taught us the wrong lesson. Mm -hmm. And that is that you can get away with a win even when you don't prepare the right way. Some teams might be able to do that. I don't know if we have that kind of team. 
And so I think we got our edge back. And I told the guys on Saturday before the game, I said, you've earned the right this week to go out and play well. So go out and play with confidence. And, and they did. And uh, whether it's you or E or Kalani, you've all used the same C word, confidence. Uh, it wasn't false bravado. It was a belief that the week of work and the edge had been retained to where, yeah, we're going we're gonna to go toe-to-toe with this tough team and get the result we want. I think there was there was no question that we had confidence going into the game, and the players were excited about it. They were excited about the game plan and, and believed that we could go in and play with them. I don't think you have that result otherwise. You've been a part of countless big wins in your career. Where does what happened Saturday kind of fall for you in terms of what the result meant for this group a week after a really tough day? Um, yeah, it's in terms of my career, coaching 25 years, there have been a lot that have been meaningful yeah. to me. I, I can think back to a couple of the wins I had as a high school coach, my first year coaching, um, certainly the national championship season at Auburn. But this one's up there because of where this group has come from and, and the difference in their – mentality and their confidence and just I, I think we see a different group of players than than we saw um, eight months ago when we started this journey. I want to take you back to the game for a couple of moments. Uh, Wisconsin is up 7 nothing midway midway through the first. They, they, they've just taken the 7 nothing lead. Ensuing drive and second play into the drive, Squally's breaking off a 44-yard run to get you into scoring territory. How big was that play? In, in setting the table for what would follow, do you think? I think big plays fuel emotion. And so I think our sideline and our entire team was energized by that. But I think they were energized by the first play, too, when, when Aleva took it around the edge on a jet sweep. And we had certainly preached the value of that and the blocking that, that went into that. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I think having that, that type of play certainly um, certainly gives you further confidence and it validates – the game plan that that you've been practicing all week. He had a couple of uh, runs of 40 plus yards and and there's a stat out there called uh, explosive drive. An explosive drive is relatively simplistic, but it simply means you've had a drive in which you've averaged 10 yards or more per play and you had your first explosive drive of the season in the Wisconsin game. The value of big plays or explosive plays or chunk plays to you. How do you view it? Huge, huge. And we haven't had very many. And this was uh, the first game that we've had a couple of long runs like that <clears throat> and you know our our, uh, our rushing game was really good all day. Um, we uh, we averaged 8.24 yards per carry. If you take if you take a couple of quarterback runs out of it, and I do that just because that's how we um, gauge it. How you measure? That's how we measure yeah. our run game. Uh, but what was the, which was really good. I mean, you, you look at the other teams that have played against them in the last year and a half, you don't see many many of those against this defense. And I've played against this defense a couple of times before, and they're, they're really sound. But the other thing that I was probably even more proud of is that our run efficiency was 76%, which every time you run, you're looking at do you make four yards or more, or if it's a short yardage goal line situation, did you gain half the distance necessary to, to, uh, to gain the first down or put yourself in the end zone? So that, that run efficiency at being at 76% said that we didn't just have big runs, but we were consistently gaining the yardage necessary. And that was one of the points that we made to our team. Every, every week we talk about keys to the game, and the first one we talked about this week was that we had to grind out four yards. And against Wisconsin, one of the best running teams in college football, uh, BYU's overall run play success rate, factoring in what you've talked about and all running plays, superseded that of the Badgers. Uh, as a team, even when you factor in uh, yardage lost on non-true running plays, uh, sacks, what have you, the yards per carry ends up at 6.8 uh, at Wisconsin. And uh, when BYU's just five yards per rush or greater, since 2005, we're talking about a record of 45 and 5. And under Kalani, it's 10 and 1 when you're averaging just five yards per rush or greater, and that number pushed seven at Wisconsin. And as you know, that's going to be one of the keys to any win you get, regardless of venue. But especially in that kind of game against that kind of team, you should be really proud of how the ground game performed. No question that's true. And, and for us to, uh, to be the type of team we want to be, that's, that's got to be uh, in that neighborhood. Uh, right before the break, I want to I want to talk about one quick element before we before we do, do take a break. The game almost swung in a pretty dramatic fashion for you right before halftime. Uh, Dallin Holker's catch gets overturned. If that was a good catch and you're punching it in, suddenly you're up 21 to seven in Madison. 
the catch is overturned, and it's a 14-14 game at halftime. So it's a what-could-have-been situation for a minute there, yet the response to the swing there was really positive. It was a, it was a moment of adversity from which you rebounded really well. Yeah, I was proud of our team on Saturday. They didn't they didn't worry about the scoreboard, and that's one of the things I talk to our our players about all the time is not pay attention to the scoreboard, whether we're up 21, down 21, or it's a tie game going into the closing seconds. All we're focused on is one play at a time, and I think if you have that mentality, then then those highs and lows don't affect you as much emotionally. All right, Jeff Grimes is our guest. He's BYU's offensive coordinator, and this is the Coordinator's Corner. It is break time. More with Coach Grimes, including your social media contributions, coming up with hashtag CCBYU. It is the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's. More with the coach right after this. I'm a believer. They're important. I'm a believer. They have a compelling story. They are worth getting to know. Watch the story track tomorrow at 8 Mountain on BYU TV. Viewers can get involved by going to randomaxtv.com and nominating either people who need help in their lives or people who are a force of good in their community and just need a step up or something like that or the recognition that they are a good person. Sometimes you, that's all you really need is that recognition that you're a good person. You're a good person. Sorry, I just wanted to give you that recognition. Don't miss Random Acts tomorrow at 7 Mountain on BYU TV. Yo, man, I'm about to get Kurt Cram for here. I thought you said it was like a masterpiece. A scorpion stung me. It's like a masterpiece in the sense that it's not what. The poison. You're already dying. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Two for one sound bar, baby. Woo! Ah! Sir, I don't think this is going to work. Writers have to have a thick skin. Yes, I see you wrote that on page 20. Maybe try less bad cop, more good cop. Don't miss Studio C tonight at 7 Mountain on BYU TV. The Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. BYU's Offensive Coordinator, Jeff Grimes, our guest with me till the top of the hour. BYU now 2-1 and one and ranked 25th in the AP poll after defeating previously 6th-ranked Wisconsin. 24-21, the loss dropping the Badgers out of the AP Top 10 for the first time in 26 weeks. That was a record-long streak for that program. It also ended Wisconsin's long regular season and non-conference home win streaks that went back years Coach Grimes, coming off the 4-9 uh, season as BYU was, it took BYU all of three games, including a, a narrow home loss, to, to get back in the national rankings. And regardless of the import you place on things like a top 25, especially early, it is a show of respect and, and uh, a bit of a reward for the hard work you guys have put in. And certainly the fan base gets energized by seeing their team uh, back in the rankings. Yeah, I think rankings are uh, a fun thing for the fans. <laughs> I don't know that they're always a good thing for for the team necessarily. And my message to the to the offense today is going to be great job. Let's enjoy it for about another hour once we start meeting with them, and then that's going to be it. It's over with. And and whether um, whether we're ranked twenty fifth or seventy fifth, that really has no bearing on on our. Uh, performance this week against McNeese to social media from Twitter it is at uh, Robert Jason C using the hashtag CCBYU question for coach Grimes he says after three games against power five competition how do you feel about the depth of the offense including the current health of your players um, you know I feel better about the depth of our offense now than I ever have uh, there were a number of players who played in this game who hadn't played at all or had played in a very limited so, um, sense to this point. 
And one of the things that we've preached since we've gotten here as an offensive staff is that you have to earn your reps. And sometimes you you see some guys that played in the first couple of games that maybe um, fans might not have anticipated. And then in this last game, we played some guys that might not have been anticipated or some guys played more than some others who had more experience or who had played more in the first couple of games. And so I think we're, and then we win while doing that. So I think that that adds some credibility to what we're saying as coaches, and that is how you practice does matter, and the guys who practice well are going to play on on Saturday, and that you earn your reps. And so um, what that does is it creates real competition because now the players believe what we're saying. It's valid. We can win with or without any one of you. The injuries I'm going to reference were on the other side of the ball, mind you. That said, when you play without a butch pau and you lose a die in in game, and even Sione gets uh, uh, banged up and leaves for a little bit. Does that give the team confidence too? Knowing you went in and went toe to toe with a really tough team, and did so with uh, with the next man up having to be a factor in, in that venue. Yeah, I think it certainly does. And and uh, while we didn't have those same sort of injuries on offense, we did have some new guys playing in some different roles. And so, yeah, I think I think it I think it gives um, confidence to the guys who took. Uh, the place of some other players, but it also does um, add add some confidence to the entire team. Which reminds me that you did play without Braden L. Bakri. So that is a that, that, that is a big loss for your with a starting fullback being out. So we see a little more of Dallin Holker lining up in the backfield, and that's a guy you're down. Uh, Keanu Seliapanga, who switches from defense to offense in camp, ends up playing a larger role for you on Saturday. So there were those kinds of things you referenced that came into play. Yeah, really, really, really proud of Keanu. Uh, just... Just a wonderful young man, and we we felt blessed to have him when uh, when the defensive staff okayed moving him over to offense. Uh, we were excited and knew that he would get on the field at some point. But he's just gotten better and better each week, and he's he's proved his value. And after the game, just to give him a hug and <laughs> and see the look on his face, and for him to say, "Coach, thank you so much. This is the best move forever for me." It it it, it made it worthwhile. Coach Tuiaki has a pretty big group of D linemen. What? What did you see that told you that guy would be good on the other side of the ball and then getting him there? How, what was the process like? Well, I think you always look to move guys from one position to another in order to um, help your overall depth and, and performance. And um, for for him, it was just a guy that had the right build, that had good athleticism, that for whatever reason hadn't put it all together yet in terms of performance on the defensive line. And I just I really felt like he had the skill set necessary to be a good offensive lineman. And so we we talked to uh, the defense about it, and um, we actually talked about it in the spring and kind of went back and forth on it. Keanu wasn't sure in the beginning either, and so we want to make sure that the player feels right about it as well. And this fall, he felt right about it. The coaches felt right about it, and so we made the move. And he's your first big change in terms of in-game rotation at, at on the on the O line, hasn't he been through through three games for the most That's part? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay, how deep, deep do you feel you have gotten at this point in terms of guys you you you, you trust uh, for for reps? Um, it depends on the position. Um, I think in the offensive line we've got a couple of guys that that we feel like are ready to step in and play if needed. Um, at tight end, obviously, we have a number of guys who we feel like can play, although they fill different roles. Um, kind of the same at running back, and it was good to get Riley Burt involved a little bit this week and, and get him in the game. He's a guy that I think, again, has earned some merit. Um, at receiver, uh, we have a bunch of guys, and playing some guys who hadn't played yet, particularly a couple of those young guys, um, I think certainly shows that. Speaking of what you just mentioned, it uh, leads to our next social media question from at RT Nelson BYU. Riley Burt and Lopini Katoa showed pretty well. The question goes in limited carries against Wisconsin. How good do you feel about the running back position behind Squally heading into McNeese State? Better about it than I have at any time. <laughs> and at the at during the spring and in, in fall camp, I said a number of times I wasn't sure yet that that group was what we needed, and and they were still a little bit unproven. And I think now we're getting into the position where we can say we've we've had a number of guys who can do some things and feel a lot better about it. Uh, all of the uh, that there are uh, of the non quarterbacks who've gotten at least five carries so far, and this would include a couple of wideouts. Uh, they're all averaging five yards or more per carry. Uh, Squally's at five point two, uh, Lapini's at to five even, and then a couple of wideouts. 
Uh, Hifo and Kali are at 7.3 and 6.8. Um, so we should give it to the whiteouts more? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Simply saying, when, when you, uh, the guys who are getting the most looks are, generally speaking, doing what you'd like them to do with the football when they get it. Not lose yards and give yourselves uh, gains that always increase and help your down and distance scenario. Yes. Which is a positive. Yes, they are. They definitely are. And, and they've learned how to run the plays the right way, not necessarily looking for the huge gain, but taking the gain that's there. And it says a lot about our about our blocking. Um, and certainly that starts with the O-line, but it's not just the O-line. Everybody blocks. Um, so the tight ends, the other receivers that are involved, everybody's blocking, and, and we've demanded that from the beginning, but they've certainly met that. Last year's BYU team was 126th in red zone touchdown percentage. This year's team so far is tied for 32nd. Last year's team was, I think, 119th in turnover margin. This team is around 29th. And in both of your wins, not coincidentally, zero giveaways. That's something we stress every single day. And we want to be one of the best executing teams in the country, and that starts with not turning the football over, something that we work on, literally work on every single day and emphasize every day and and. That, that ended up being the difference in a very close game. They turned it over once, and we didn't turn it over. And the other thing I was proud of is that we only had two offensive penalties. Both of them hurt us a little bit from a yardage standpoint. A 10-yard holding penalty sets you back. But when you're playing hard, particularly when you're running the ball on the edge as much as we did on Saturday, you're going to have a couple of those every now and then, and we're not accepting of them. Um, but no pre-snap penalties, no false starts, no illegal formations with a lot of formations, a lot of shifts and motions in this game plan, the most that we've done to this point. So I was really pleased with that as well. Not only did BYU have the lone giveaway, the lone takeaway in the game, they turned it into a touchdown, and that uh, is segues into that red zone TD number, and it was a difference maker on Saturday. Heading to break now on the Coordinator's Corner. When we come back, more of your social media questions using hashtag CCBYU for Jeff Grimes as we continue live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960 back right after this. I would like to congratulate the men's basketball team on their big win this weekend. I know that one of them is here. I want you to stand up. Stand up. It's not me. I'm not on the team. Then how do you explain this? I bought it. He's on the team. Come on, Jake. There's no need to be humble. I'm, I'm not on the team. No midterm if he makes this shot, if he misses extra homework. Gear so legit, they'll think you're on the team. BYU Store. Get ready for sports action here on BYU TV. Tonight at 5.30 Mountain, kick off the night with an exciting women's soccer game between BYU and Long Beach State. It's sure to have you on your feet. Live Thursday at 7 Mountain, BYU and Pacific go at it in a high-stakes women's volleyball matchup. Shout ace for the Cougars as they battle it out with the Tigers. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. A foundling hospital. A vow of friendship. A ruthless matron. self-willed girl with plans of her own. Don't miss the next episode of Heady Feather, Sunday at 6 Mountain on BYU TV. Some say if you're looking for the soul of America, you'll find it right here in Memphis, Tennessee. But if Memphis is the soul of America, then what's the soul of Memphis? From the banks of the Mississippi to the neon lights of Beale Street, that soul's hiding somewhere, and I've got to put it all in one painting. Join me as we paint the town of Memphis, Tennessee. Don't miss Painting the Town tomorrow at 8.30 Mountain on BYU TV. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. Offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes, my guest in this half hour. Just a few moments left with Coach Grimes. 2-1 uh, and one BYU hosting 3-0 and oh, McNeese State out of the FCS ranks. Uh, BYU is 12-0 and oh all-time versus FCS opponents. We'll have a 2 o'clock pregame on the radio, 3 o'clock pregame on BYU TV, and then the kick at 4. McNeese State uh, featuring a couple of uh, 
couple of Orgerons on the roster. Sons yeah. of Ed, yep. your, your, your yep. former uh, yep. head coaching yep. boss. Yeah. I know I know the boys, good kids, and uh, and good players. And this team is a better team than people realize. We actually were going to play them, had them scheduled a couple years ago at LSU, and we ended up playing, I think, we had three or four plays, one offensive series, and then we had a lightning delay, and we waited for about three or four hours and then ended up not playing the game. It was the first game of the season. Huh. And... Although we didn't actually play much of that game, I watched them and and watched the entire season's worth of film from the previous year. And um, they're a talented team. They've got a lot of guys that can run and hit, and they've been the type of team that has surprised people who didn't respect them. And so I feel like um, I feel like it'll be another challenge for us, and and we're certainly looking forward to that. Back to social media, using the hashtag CCBYU on Twitter for Coach Jeff Grimes. At Cougar Stats asks, are all runs with jet sweep motion option plays, quote-unquote, where the QB is having to make a read, or are some of them predetermined? Um, the short answer is no. They're not They're not all options. A lot of them are predetermined in terms of uh, making making a call in which we want to fake the jet or hand the jet ahead of time. Could be a it could be a play action pass where we know we're going to fake it. Um, it could be a screen or it could be a a fake run to Squally that we know we're going to hand the jet. We can do any number of things with it. X's and O's question: uh, Jet sweep and fly sweep are often used interchangeably. Some say it's it's fly if it's more of a slot. It's jet if it's more than a more of a flank. How do you do you view them the same way? Do you think they're the same thing? They're the same thing. Good because I because I for I, I I for whatever reason have been going fly sweep most of my play by play career, and so I stick with it a lot. I'm not really totally into jet, but they're basically the same. I'm okay with fly sweep, right? It's the same thing, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. We actually have both terms in our playbook depending on which type it is. So okay. you're more than good with us. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, the fact that Squally Canada outrushed Heisman Trophy candidate Jonathan Taylor on Saturday. How do you feel about that? I love Squally. He is a guy that's come so far um, in the short time that I've been here. From where he was uh, this spring, um, even from where he was at times during fall camp to where he is now, just the confidence and energy that he brings to our offense and um, – just, uh, I just know if we give him a crease, he's going to find running room in there. And that gives me great confidence as a play caller. He's got five rushing touchdowns now. When he's gotten near the goal line, he's gotten you in. Yeah, yes. He, he's he's really good at getting his pads down and finding a seam. Uh, points per possession inside the 40. A lot of people just like to look at red zone, and it's important you score in the red zone. Points per possession inside the 40. At Arizona, it was 4.8. Versus Cal, it was 1.8. And versus Wisconsin, it was 4.2. Coincidentally, the high numbers correspond to your two wins. How do you view getting inside the 40 as opposed to getting inside the 20, and what are your expectations that way relative to what's a reasonable number, or do you really examine that number in great detail? Well, I think any time you get within, um, you know, some people call it scoring range, um, I think once you're inside the 25, then you say, okay, one good pass play would get us in the end zone. So you think of your passing game a little bit differently there. The running game sometimes changes, sometimes it doesn't, depending on what the defense does. Inside the 40, though, you got to feel like you're going to walk away with points. In, in the type of offense that we run, we feel like we've got to score. And Skyler Southam got his first look from deep, uh, missed from 52, but had the leg to get there. You still feel good about him, and I know you'll use him a lot over the next few years. And let's not, let's not forget, the, the, the 45-yarder to win it, no chip shot. No, it wasn't, and um, and our holder did a great job. It on was that a low play, snap, by the way. Yeah, um, something that's often overlooked. Um, but yeah, that gives us confidence too, for sure. Okay, uh, your McNeese State game kicks at uh, four o'clock on the first day of fall at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Your team is ranked, but you don't care about. But it's going to be a big crowd. It's going to be a great day for football, and it's. I hope you have a great week of work, leading to a, a really fun Saturday for for you, the team, and the fan base. I hope so too. Can't can't wait to uh, to put another game plan together and and uh, hopefully put something together that our fans will be excited about. Jeff, good to be with you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Greg. All right, that's Coach Jeff Grimes. That'll do it for the coordinators' corner. Next week, we visit with coaches Grimes and Lamb, and as we look back on the McNeese State game and preview BYU at Washington. Thanks to producer Jason Shepard, Michael Miner, and the crew from BYU TV and from BYU Radio. Sean O'Neill, Terry South, Sean Fay, Sterling Richards, and Lindsey Peterson, along with Don Shaline. I'm Greg Rubel. This has been the coordinators' corner. We'll talk to you next week, one o'clock Eastern, eleven a.m. Mountain, on BYU Radio. So long. Where did I
lost his job, didn't he? Maybe. Dad, don't worry. Things are gonna change for us. I have a plan. Ramona, you are clear for airdrop. Would you care for a car wash today? Everybody loves Beezus, and everybody hates me! I'd rather sell it than let the bank take the house. Did I do something wrong? No. Not this.